Hello everybody, uh, my name is Tim Evans and I'm delighted to chair this evening's uh, distinguished lecture with Liam Halligan. Uh, can I start by thanking Christiana Rose and all the team at Middlesex University who have been so brilliant on the support side and bringing everyone together. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce uh, this evening. To tell you the truth, I can't quite remember when I first met Liam, it was a good few years ago. Um, and I just going to share a few things that I do know about him. Um, I think most of us uh, this evening know that for a long time he was uh, the economics guy on Channel 4 News. He's written over the years for many, many publications. He's written for The Economist. The Econo uh, the, he's been a member, I think, of the, Econo uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, he has written uh, for Prospect Magazine. Uh, he's written for Wall Street Journal, um, and he's had a long relationship where he now writes a column at the Telegraph, particularly on the Sunday Telegraph. Um, but what's so important about him is not just his journalistic background, he also has a, a DPhil from Oxford, um, I believe St Anthony's College, which is a very prestigious college there, and he also has uh, his first degree, which is a first class degree in economics from Warwick. What intrigues me uh, about him um, is that he grew up locally to Middlesex University. Uh, he grew up in Kingsbury. I believe he went to uh, school in Harrow. He didn't actually go to Harrow School, but he got a, he won a scholarship to John Lyons School, which I believe is school. I think locally they call it down the hill from Harrow. Um, and uh, he's been a good friend to Middlesex University over the years. He attended one of our uh, Middlesex University Westminster dinners a few years ago. And I think it was in that evening that I discovered his local bond and his local relationship to us or his affection to us because he grew up in our part of London. Liam, it's taken us a good couple of years. I think we've been going through the um, turpitude of Brexit and now the pandemic and here we are we finally have you with us it is an absolute delight and an honour to have you with us um, you've written extensively and broadcast extensively recently uh, in recent years on on an issue that's close to our hearts at the uni because if you know anything about Middlesex you'll know that we're one of the world's most diverse universities. We're one of the top 15 most diverse universities. Uh, we have campuses in Malta, Mauritius, Dubai. Um, we have students, I think, from more than 150 countries. And although most of them are young, probably in this country, the biggest challenge the young face today isn't just economic uncertainty um, and questions around how they're going to create wealth and uh, develop their careers but of course it is how are they going to get on the housing ladder and it's to that I don't know anyone uh, who's done more thinking more work more probing than you on this subject so it's an absolute delight to have you with us um, and without further ado Liam welcome back to your local patch welcome back to Middlesex University. Thanks for that kind introduction uh, Tim and thanks to your team um, for facilitating this lecture tonight. What a shame we're not all together uh, in person over a few drinks before and after, um, but that's the world we live in at the moment, so uh, let's, let's press on. I, I am a local boy, or at least I would be if I was given this lecture, not virtually. Um, I was born and raised in an Irish Catholic family in Kingsbury, as Tim said, um, and during my A-levels, when I finally decided I needed to do some work and couldn't just busk it, um, um, I would often walk, jog, cycle or get the 183 bus from Kingsbury to uh, Hendon uh, during weekends and holidays studying in the Middle e Middlesex University Library and we didn't, we didn't coordinate these introductory comments but I was really taken with what Tim just said because at that Middlesex University Library I met a succession of students who were older than me, often of immigrant stocks themselves they were studying law, accounting, finance, and by the coffee machine and then the local cafe, we'd chat about studying and taking opportunities, their motivations, their determinations and their drive. All that was inspiring to me. 
and it rubbed off. And I related to their stories of families arriving in this country with nothing and managing to thrive via education, not just as a person, but you know, personally, um, not just as a fellow citizen, but that was part of my story as well. So I've always thought of Middlesex University, if I may say so, as a kind of social mobility factory the kind of institution where any claim that the UK still has to being a genuinely meritocratic society is actually realised. It's where that British dream of making good through learning, qualification and hard work really does happen. So alongside education, for me, the second big pillar of that British dream, if you like, is home ownership. And it certainly was for my family just a few miles down the road from where we would all be if we weren't where we all currently are. So home ownership allowed my parents to achieve a decent, if modest lifestyle, and above all, that vital sense of security for themselves and for their children, which their respective childhoods had, short, had sorely um, lacked. My parents were both working class people who left school age 16. They had no professional qualifications. The idea of going to university was completely outlandish. Even though they passed the 11 plus, they didn't go to grammar school. It was that kind of a background. But they were part of a generation born in the 40s, 50s, who, as the UK got wealthier, through hard work and saving, were able to forge for themselves a life demonstrably more prosperous and with so much more choice than that of their parents. And my generation, those born in the 60s and 70s, and guess which one I was born in, were for the most part able to do the same. And the key event, the key financial event in our lives often achieved before the age of 30, was buying our first home. And for many of us, that was the all-important step, contributing to a mortgage each month rather than paying rent to somebody else. That meant we could gradually build equity value, trade upwards as we started a family and needed more space. And eventually, after 25 years or so of manageable monthly payments, most of the time, own a substantial asset outright. So my parents, having themselves grown up in substandard housing amid financial insecurity, they strove in their young adulthood to put all that behind them by buying their own home, as did I. And the fact that they managed to do that as their children were born, it revolutionized their view of themselves. And in my father's case, as somebody who grew up in the West of Ireland, his broader attitude to the UK, giving him a fair chance. So getting on the property ladder has since the Second World War meant for tens of millions of us living here in Britain, wherever we're born, wherever we're from, uh, not just freedom from landlords and physical security of home ownership, but you know, a, a tangible, meaningful stake in an increasingly wealthy society. And that's why I wrote this book, Home Truths, which started off as a love letter to home ownership, but it developed from there as I'll outline. Today, of course, the situation for young adults is very difficult. If you're the child of the 80s, the 90s or beyond, the progress that previous generations routinely enjoyed, at least the previous two generations, now seems wholly unobtainable. For millions of so-called millennials and Generation Z who followed them into adulthood, the British dream of home ownership has been crushed. For well over a decade now, housing, in my view, has been the most pressing domestic policy challenge facing the UK. Far too few of us, far too few homes have been built over the last 30 years and relentless demand in the face of inadequate supply that's seen prices spiral upwards. And that's why for millions of hardworking people now, even well-paid professionals, double income households, if you like, they're now being denied that security and stability of home ownership and lower down the income scale. And this is what I really uh, took on board while writing Home Truths, lower down the income scale among other more vulnerable families, they're now, there's a now desperate lack of social housing as well. And that's driving serious overcrowding in our country and record levels of homelessness resulting in considerable, sorry about that, resulting in considerable misery, suffering and social deprivation. So since early 2020, domestic and international politics has of course been dominated by by the COVID pandemic and other issues not directly linked to measuring or tackling that virus have failed to punch through. But take it from me, ladies and gentlemen, away from the headlines throughout this COVID related lockdown across Westminster, across a lot of local authorities, um, there's been a real refocusing and intensification of the political discourse 
when it comes to housing. That's because the UK government's response to this virus has meant that for much of this year, many of us have spent far more time at home than usual, both working and just living, if you like. And that's put in stark relief the gulf in circumstances between those who enjoy spacious accommodation with spare rooms and gardens and others living in more cramped, overcrowded conditions. And as such, I'd say that COVID has emphasised the reality that for far too many people in Britain, their physical accommodation, rather than acting as a place of comfort and refuge, is actually a major source of misery. And it may even be a risk uh, to their health given the striking correlation that we see now between COVID-related deaths and substandard accommodation. Now, my book, Home Truths, which sparked the invitation to give this lecture, I guess, was published in November 2019, but there's a paperback out in a couple of months for which I've just written a new introduction. And this COVID pandemic and our response to it, I wrote in that new intro introduction, has clearly accentuated the very significant human impact of the UK's systemic housing problem, bringing the chronic shortage of adequate homes into sharp focus. It has exposed, I say, more starkly than at any time in living memory, the disadvantages of not living in decent, relatively spacious accommodation. So this lecture will be structured as follows. I'm about to show you a handful of slides, just a handful outlining some of the problems we face. There'll be no death by PowerPoint, just a few graphs to help you grasp the problems we're facing. I'll then speak about how we fix our broken housing market in the political vernacular, give you, give you a short manifesto of policy options, which will hopefully result in more homes, incentivizing above all an industry to build that often doesn't want to build for reasons that I'll come to. And basically the government has wrongly focused on the demand side of the housing uh, market, to, demand side reforms, helping buyers to purchase overpriced, really expensive homes by help to buy and other initiatives. And I say that that, apart from for a few lucky uh, few, uh, that makes a bad situation worse. It juices up demand and pushes up prices even more. Instead, the central argument of my book is that we need more supply side reforms, ensuring more homes are built. So actually buying or renting a house becomes gradually more affordable. And reforming the market for land also, that will help local authorities to access building acreage at more reasonable prices, allowing them to build more spacious, more and more spacious social housing too. So before my policy manifesto and some concluding remarks, let's have a look at some slides. Christiana, could you go to the first slide, please? So this first slide, which I hope you can see, it's it's, a, it's basically trying to outline the home shortage that we have, and we can make these slides available and we're recording this, so you don't have to take any notes. Just, just, just look at the pictures if you like. Basically, we need around 250,000 homes each year. It's around two and a half million each decade for, for commercial sale or rent and social housing to fit in with our natural demography. And since the 60s and into the 70s, really, ever since then, we failed to build enough homes with the amount of homes we're building each decade sharply declining even though our population has been going up quite a lot so there's the basic problem and it's estimated that around three million too few homes have been built over the last 30 to 40 years and this so this is a cross-party problem uh, and between 1991 and 2016 some incredible numbers home ownership among 25 to 34 year olds fell from over two-thirds to under two-fifths uh, and even among older uh, adults, when, you know, crucial family forming age, these two age groups, among, even among older adults, um, you know, almost half of people couldn't buy a home. And we now have an overall rate of home ownership, which is well below the EU average. So we're not a nation of homeowners anymore, if you like. And all this has big implications on family formation and life chances for the majority of a generation with today's adults being more on housing and are less likely to dock your own empires, I le uh, left off the end of that sentence, than any generation, ladies and gentlemen, since the 1930s. And you can see there in the bottom graph the, the growing gap between earnings and house prices. I've scaled them both back to 100 to back in the late 90s when I bought my first home. And you can see there earnings have gone up by about 70 or 80 percent 
and uh, average house prices of of of, of more than more almost more than almost tripled. So that's basically where the affordability crisis is. Could you go on to the next uh, next slide, please, Christiana? So this next slide uh, is about social housing, and I've written anti-social housing because it's as if we've forgotten how to build social housing. And by social housing, in this instance, I mean uh, affordable homes, but particularly council housing, both of them available at subsidised uh, uh, rent uh, and through housing associations too. So back in 79, around a third of UK households were living in social housing, uh, that's housing association and council homes, and now it's 17%, so it's gone down a lot. And housing construction, social housing construction has absolutely flattened. It went down during the Thatcher years, the, from the 80, during the 80s, but look what happened during Blair and Brown. Almost no social housing was built in this country. It's completely weird that a Labour administration chose to build almost no social housing. Um, and it's, uh, you know, when the, the right to buy was introduced, as, as, as Professor Tim Evans will tell you, there was a flip side to the legislation for every council home that sold off, the council had to build another one. And the original legislation had to do that before they sold it. That went by the wayside. So we've really denuded our stock of social housing. We're now in a situation where these are figures from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, they don't publish them very often, but concealed households, that's where you have more than one household living in one house. That doesn't just mean, you know, that's not that's not like, um, say, a, a single mum living with her mum. It's not that. It's when you have two separate households, with sort of two couples, if you like, with or without children, but often with children, living in the same single house. There, the number of concealed households is now up more than 50% since 2010. It's 2.6 million, which is getting on for one in 10 households in this country, quite astonishing. And also when you look up the overcrowding and the homelessness numbers, homelessness, we're not talking about rough sleeping, we're talking about people who are in temporary accommodation. Um, so not, not, not a council house that's, that, that they live in permanently, but in temporary uh, uh, state funded accommodation. Um, halfway houses, if you like, in the old Cathy Come Home vernacular, the number of those people is up tenfold uh, in my lifetime. So this is a major problem. And rather than building more social housing, which is what we need to do, we're spending £25 billion a year, huge amounts of money, paying landlords to house social tenants. I mean, some social landlords aren't bad, but a lot of them aren't good. And the quality of the housing that they provide is often deeply substandard not always um, but we need to convert that subsidy that goes into social housing from benefits back into bricks building social homes that the state then owns and can put on its balance sheet rather than just paying mortgages for other social landlords as they build housing benefit empires if you like next slide please so the next slide is um um is uh uh, you can't live in a planning permission. Sajid Javid said that in 2016. He was the first frontline cabinet minister who, in my experience, really understood what was happening. Um, you can think what you like about conservatives, but you know he, he has serious levels of financial literacy as a, as a market trader, uh, as in city trader, not selling uh, fruit and veg, um, as it were. Uh, and he, he really got it, in my view. Uh, and what we've seen in recent years is a huge increase in the number of planning permissions being given, but a slowdown in the rate at which those planning permissions are actually being built out. And that's shown in the circle there, uh, where you've got the increase in units granting planning permission and a much slower increase um, uh, in houses actually being built. It's very hard to get hold of these numbers. Uh, and since then, actually, Research for Home Truths, I've compiled a huge spreadsheet. There are almost a million planning permissions outstanding in this country now. A million homes, permits to build that have not been built. And that's largely because the big house builders, the big developers, they hoover up a huge amount of the planning permissions and then they sit on their balance sheets, they enhance their share prices, they stop smaller builders from getting those planning permissions, of course, and then they often don't build them. The bottom left-hand corner of that slide, you see research there showing that between 2012 and 2016, uh, one in two homes granted planning permission in London uh, wasn't built. This is a major, major problem. The slow, deliberately slow build out 
of homes as big developers which control the market make bigger profits overall by building slowly to keep prices high on higher margins and any, any equity analyst will tell you any person who studies uh, the house building industry for a living will tell you if they're honest and objective that that is what happens and there's Sajid Javid agreeing with me there and he said that in front of the Tory party conference to literally a sharp intake of breath I was in the room next slide please this is the problem. Our housing industry is increasingly concentrated. What means is that it's dominated more and more by a smaller number of large firms. Back in 2008, before the financial crisis, you'll see there, ladies and gentlemen, small builders, you know, sort of dad and son operations, a couple of guys with, with a couple of vans were building 28% of our homes and their medium sized partners. Um, and often they subcontracted from each other between them, they were building almost 70% of our homes. And these guys build quickly. They get a planning permission, they build it. They haven't got fast reserves of cash. They need the cash flow. They build quickly. Look at it now in 2015, after the financial crisis, a lot of small firms were wiped out and they haven't come back. You've now got such firms, you know, the smaller guys building 12% of homes and the medium sized guys uh, building far fewer too and you've got the big house builders building getting on for two-thirds of houses uh, the 2000 plus the volume builders who can sit and wait they've got deep pockets they can control local markets they can act as local if you like oligopolies as we say in economics and since those numbers 2015 the house building industry has got far far more concentrated still as more and more small builders have gone to the wall and again this is not, if you're objective, this is not controversial analysis. This is why so much money has piled into the big listed house builders in recent years, and they've been so wildly profitable. There you go, House of Lords, July 2016. The UK's house building industry now has all the characteristics of an oligopoly. I would go further. I won't name names, but I would say that a lot of our big house builders in their localised markets act as cartels, and cartels are illegal, and that's why we need a full, fully blown competition and markets authority uh, investigation now into our house building industry. I back capitalism, but the way they act is not capitalism. Next slide, please. Just my fi final, final analytical slide. Um, we say we want more homes and that's what surveys show. You've now got, even, you know, for years, as I outlined in Home Truths, there's been what I call the bottom left-hand corner there, a lot, an iron triangle of vested interests, wanting house building to go slow to keep house prices high. And that iron triangle of vested interests has, has comprised the big house builders, it's comprised the banks who are really exposed to property loans, uh, who want prices to keep rising to maintain their balance sheets, and it's comprised homeowners themselves who tend to vote in big numbers and tend to vote conservative most of the time. That political geometry now is shifting because more and more, even people from wealthy families, their kids can't get on the housing ladder. Um, and so they understand that more homes want to be built, but they don't want them built near them. Uh, the graph shows that people want more homes to be built. A big change in the BSAS, the British Social Attitude Survey, across the age range, do you want more house building in your area? That's fine, as long as it's not in my backyard. And this is the problem. So what you need to do rather than sort of draconian running roughshod over local people planning reforms, which Boris is trying to get through the house at the moment with some dodgy algorithm, which we can talk about in the Q&A if you like, you have to incentivize local people to want housing. And to do that, it's a core argument of my book. You have to share the planning uplift, ladies and gentlemen. What does that mean? So when you convert agricultural land, when you give it residential planning permission, the value of that land can rocket. And I'm not saying it doubles or goes up by 10 times. It can go up by 100, 200, 300 fold the value of land, particularly if it's near a big city. And that just shows the pent up demand that there is for housing. But rather than all that uplift or nearly all that uplift going to the landowner or the developer who's optioned the land off the landowner or the farmer or whoever it is, uh, that planning gain should be systematically shared far, far more than it currently is. That's what happens in many European countries. It happens in many parts of the United States. It happens across Asia, Singapore, Hong Kong was built on shared planning uplift. You can then 
get that money, stays at the local authority level, the landowner still gets a fair price, and you channel money as houses are being built from that uplift into serious infrastructure that goes with those houses. So in any particular town, you might have you know, a developer coming forward. If the uplift is shared, then you'll get that new local primary school that lots of the younger families want. You might get that bypass that raises the price of everybody's house as the center of town becomes more uh, desirable place to live. You might get that local hospital. Um, and that is how you change the politics of local planning. You use the uplift, you share the uplift, you have much less speculation in the land market. Land prices come down down overall because developers and landowners have far less incentive to sit on land forever and ever and ever. And then the, 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 the price that the land does raise, you split it. Uh, and so that means you have much, much more reasonable prices for land. And back in the, the 40s and the 50s, when we used to do this in the UK, the, end, the, the uh, new build houses, the cops are after me, new build houses, the price of the land accounted for about 5% of the price of the home. I did a lot of research on my actual house in Kingsbury. Uh, I found the original deeds. I found the, I found the, the, the original um, uh, advert to, to buy it. And I worked out that at that time, and it's in keeping with other uh, uh, academic studies of land markets around the UK at that time, the price of the land was around 5% of the purchase price of the house. When you buy a new build house now, on average, on average, the price of the land is 65% of the price of the house. And that explains that huge rocketing since the 60s when there was a legislative change, which I'll explain, uh, between earnings going up and then house prices going up much higher. The UK is an outlier in this regard because other countries, most other advanced industrialized countries, share planning gain in a much more systematic way. So next slide, please, Christiana. And we can just leave that next slide as it is, and I'll carry on. Um, so this chronic housing shortage that I've discussed, that first slide that I showed, uh, it means that the average UK home now costs eight times average earnings. That's over half, that's sorry, that's over twice the historic norm, which is four times average earnings. When I bought my first home in the mid nineties, it was three and a half times average earnings. The price of the average home was three and a half times average earnings. That's why, you know, traditionally a mortgage was three times earnings. You have one earner in the house, three times earnings. You, 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 you know, you get a deposit together, three, three and a half times earnings. It makes it affordable. It's now eight times earnings, eight times, almost impossible for an ordinary family without help. Since then, we've had, since the, the mid nineties, of course, after the financial crisis in particular, we've had lots of quantitative easing, the Bank of England effectively printing loads of money. If you want to ask me more about that, in the Q&A you can. That's juiced up house prices a bit, but the main reason we've had such rampant house price growth driving unaffordability has been this almost unique shortage of homes in the UK. And today's affordable, uh, uh, crippling affordability multiples, they go up to 10, 12, 15 times average earnings in parts of London and not even the really posh parts of London. You know, this is what parts of London where ordinary people used to be able to buy three and four bedroomed homes and now it's impossible. And it's not just London and the southeast. In many parts of the country, as, as the graphs in Home Truths show, I'll, uh, I'll spare you of them tonight, you'll be pleased to hear. But it's not just in London and the southeast, it's big parts of the northwest, the Midlands, the West Country, parts of Scotland and Wales too. Countless young adults, ladies and gentlemen, even young professionals, well paid priced out of the housing market. That's why four out of every 10 30 year olds, four out of every 10 now lives in private rented accommodation compared to just one in 10 back in the mid nineties. And with house prices consistently uh, outpacing earnings, today's young adults are spending more on housing and are less likely to be owner occupiers than any generation, as I said over the slides, since the 1930s. And as these prices spiral away ahead of wages, ever more first time buyers, of course, we all know the story, even those holding down professional jobs, they have to rely on the bank of mum and dad if they're buying their first property. Half of all first time buyers now rely on the bank of mum and dad rising to two thirds across the southeast of the UK. And of course, that's an option that only is available to those who come from relatively wealthy backgrounds. And I think that 
undermines the notion that the UK is a progressive society. The UK housing market used to be a source of social mobility uh, and security. It's now a source, ladies and gentlemen, uh, of social disunity, uh, uh, insecurity, and increasingly political rancor. And rising house prices mean that generation rent will keep expanding. It's set to increase to 7.2 million by the end of the late 2020s, by which time just a quarter of 25 to 34 year olds will buy their own home. Just a quarter of people at that crucial childbearing age. This is now messing with our demography and that cardinal injustice that young adults feel uh, being denied a fair chance to buy a property, a, a fair chance that their parents had, um, that growing gulf between Britain's property haves and property have nots is now very, very paramount in our national life, I would say. Now, since 2013, the government's responded with demand side reforms, mainly what's called help to buy. Um, but this has just stoked further purchasing power for the lucky few who are able to access the scheme. It's also handed huge profits to large developers by channeling first time buyers into often substandard overpriced new build homes, because you can only access help to buy if you buy a new build home. It's dubbed help to sell by the house built housing industry insiders, and it's pushed up prices and handed massive multi billion pound windfalls to the UK's leading developers, consolidating their grip on the market. It's poured over 20 billion pounds of taxpayers' money into a scheme that, as I said, has helped a lucky few, but made affordability far worse for the vast majority outside the scheme. Help to Buy has been dominated by the top three or four largest house builders. They've used it to channel a, a stream of captive buyers into tens of thousands of homes, which I've got a lot of experience of this. I've made documentaries on this, done a lot of research. These new build help to buy homes, unfortunately, are often shoddy. They're often sold on extremely punitive leaseholds. You can ask me about that in the Q&A as well, if you want. And it's they've driven huge bonuses for housing industry executives at the big house builders. And yet, and yet, the large house builders are still building fewer homes now than they were before the 2008 financial crisis. And we're still building fewer homes, far fewer homes overall than before the 2008 financial crisis, despite this huge taxpayer subsidy. And that's because, as I said, the industry has become far more concentrated. So this is the Adam Smith Institute. This is a centre-right think tank. This is them on help to buy. It's thrown petrol onto a fire, say the Adam Smith Institute. Adding more demand without improving supply just raises prices. It makes homes less affordable for people who don't qualify. So that's Adam Smith, centre-right. And how about this from Shelter? The campaign group, massively respected, widely seen as a left-wing body, though very well respected, as I said, for their research. Help to buy has totally missed the mark, says Shelter, by inflating housing pr house prices and subsidising huge corporate payouts, it's made matters far worse. When the Adam Smith Institute and Shelter agree, ladies and gentlemen, that a policy is making things worse, you know that there's a serious problem. So what should we do? Well, in my book, Home Truths, I've written a manifesto for change. It's the final chapter, chapter 10. And I'll spare you, I'll briefly outline nine of the policy recommendations here, just briefly. And almost all of them deal with the vital supply side of the housing market. The first reform we need is called land value capture. And I've alluded to it earlier in my lecture and I'll outline it more here. So landowners and developers currently have a very, very strong incentive to sit on land, even if it has planning permission, waiting for the price of both acreage and homes built on it to rise. I say we should use a targeted land value tax to impose a direct cost on failing to build out plots once permission has been granted. If a home has not been completed and made ready for sale within two years of permission, the developer should become liable to pay full council tax on the unfinished properties, rising to double then triple council tax in subsequent years until a home is ready for sale. 
It's not just about starting because they'll just turn over a bit of earth and then bugger off again. It's about completing the home, putting it on the market, ready for sale at the retail level. Planning permission should be viewed as a contract to build between developers and the community, not as an ability to build if the developer feels like it. And applying a targeted land value tax in this way will alter the financial incentives faced particularly by the large developers and would help address the worst excesses of what is endemic, deliberately slow build out. Planning uplift also can often be 100, 200 fold increase in the valuation of the land. That should be captured more generally. It should be split in my view on a 50-50 basis between landowners and the developers who might have optioned the land on the one hand and the state on the other. And four fifths of the state share, so four fifths of half, should accrue automatically to the relevant local authority to be channeled into new or enhanced schools, hospitals, and other infrastructure, revolutionizing local politics. Uh, the remaining fifth should be ring fenced within the treasury for social housing and or housing related amenities in other parts of the country. At the same time, I'd advocate the existence of so-called local development corporations, state bodies that can buy agricultural land or use land the state already owns, we'll come onto that, on which they then grant planning permission and this land could be parceled up and sold as valuable building plots with at least half those plots earmarked for small and medium sized builders who are generally incentivized, as I explained, to build out quickly. So using land value capture and local development corporations completely standard in many other countries across the world would have a transformative impact on local attitudes towards housing development and related lo uh, local politics. Now, Using land value capture in the way I describe, not in a really punitive way, you can still give existing landowners a fair price. You're not CPOing them, compulsory purchasing order. You're giving them a fair price while contributing significantly to enhance local infrastructure. This is a standard mechanism used across the world. It was used successfully here in the UK during the late 40s and 50s. That's what sparked the construction boom of public and private sector homes as I outlined in the first graph that I showed you. It was legislation in 1961 that returned almost the entire planning uplift to landowners, a development I'll return to and which I refer to in my book as the last gasp of feudal Britain. There's now a broad political coalition in favor of reversing the 1961 so-called Land Compensation Act. It comprises several parliamentary inquiries, the Lord's Inquiry I referred to earlier in 2016, two subsequent inquiries of common select committees in 2017 and 2018. It comprises think tanks across the spectrum and MPs and peers from all parties to reverse this Land Compensation Act. The government though and successive governments have been far too timid in challenging the increasingly powerful landowners and developers and so they're not listening. But this Rontier system is now at the heart of our chronic housing shortage and preventing a more equitable form of economic growth. So that's the, the centerpiece of what I think needs to happen. And I'm far from alone. It's using targeted land value tax, not a general Georgist land value tax, as some of you are into political economy, maybe we can discuss it afterwards, but a targeted use of that concept in order to make sure that chief executives of big house builders are incentivized to build out quickly rather than being incentivized as they are under the custom system, current system to uh, uh, build slowly. We have a low build, high price status quo equilibrium, if you like. And it's really, it's hard to think of a system that could be less advantageous to ordinary people trying to buy a home in which they can, a modest home in which they can raise their families. That's the centerpiece, land value capture, use of local development corporations, in order to shift the incentives and reform the market for land to be more like the market for land in other countries. The second part of my manifesto concerns new towns. They're all much shorter now than the one I just went through. You'll be pleased to know. The second part is new towns. That's, so the New Towns Act of uh, 1946 meant that between 1946 and 1970, um, uh, we had this movement that took its inspiration from 
the late 19th and early 20th century garden city movement. And the new towns that happened in the UK, and they were all built on, on land gained for the most part at existing use value, at basically agricultural value, without all the planning uplift going to the landowner. It was shared in many cases. That happened in most cases prior to the 1961 Act that I referred to. And because there was plenty of uplift around that land that had been bought, there was money available to build the infrastructure and other public and community benefits that made the new towns. And it meant that builders, competitive builders, could get the land at reasonable prices so they could build reasonable homes. And some 32 new towns were developed across the UK over a 25 year period. And they're now home to 3 million people. And it's ridiculous during my lifetime over the last 50 years, when the population of the UK has gone up by 30%, very fast population growth, we've had no additional, we haven't built an additional town anywhere. We've created no new settlement of any significant size in the UK in the last 50 years. That's completely mad. And while the quality of housing and new town developments has sometimes been maligned, not least by sniffy London-based commentators who are inheriting houses in Hampstead, there's no reason that such settlements can't be characterised by high quality housing, especially when land is acquired by a local development corporation, then sold on to a range of developers at competitive prices, allowing them to buy for customers on both quality and price. So land value capture, targeted land value tax that feeds into a new new town movement with that land value capture at its heart. Manifesto point number three, social housing. Now, I haven't mentioned Grenfell tonight, but I do devote an entire chapter of Home Truths to the 2017 tragedy in which 72 people died. Um, perhaps, again, we can talk about it in, in the q and I've been writing lots about Grenfell and talking to lots of people uh, lately in the wake of the, the public inquiry and things that haven't yet been done. I am a fan of social housing. I think there will always be a need in any advanced economy for subsidized housing that provides decent, affordable, dignified accommodation for low-income households and other vulnerable groups. And as I say, the UK's current system since the early 80s, since the early 90s, I should say, of increasingly relying on private landlords to house social tenants as rents rise is causing the housing benefit bill to spiral and driving homelessness, because of course. The benefits have been capped and they don't now relate to mark rents on the open market, even in the social housing sector. So these housing benefit bill costs will escalate unless we do something. Overcrowding and homelessness will rise unless we tackle this uh, until we decisively reverse the long time, de long term decline in social house building. There are all kinds of ways in a regulated market you can harness not just the state borrowing long term, you can harness you know, private sector money that's desperate for yield. You know, the, the yield on gilts is now negative in real terms. If anyone's into finance, I can explain it later if you want. But take it from me, there are an awful lot of long term investors in the UK, pension funds, insurance companies that want to get into assets that are highly regulated and spin off a relatively low return that could be used to underpin the construction in a regulated market of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions even of decent social homes. Manifesto item number four, better planning. Now in August, since I wrote the hardback edition of Home Truths, the government has proposed a radical planning shakeup but around, as I keep saying to ministers, around four fifths of residential planning applications are now accepted uh, and over a million planning permissions are now outstanding. The problem is not a lack of planning permissions. The real problem, as again, I've said to ministers many times and they're determined to ignore it, is the ever lengthening delay between permissions being granted and homes being built because it's the big powerful builders hoovering up most of the planning permissions so the small builders can't get them and then they stage a deliberate go slow. And unless people acknowledge that, unless ministers acknowledge that and tackle this massive market failure, our chronic housing shortage will remain. It's as simple as that. Now, these latest proposals to use more zoning, some of you may have studied them. They came out in the middle of August, don't know why, but they did, pretty quiet time. 
they, they, they do make residential planning laws slightly more predictable in some localities by using zoning and that will help a bit. But the real problem remains a lack of competition in the house building industry with countless smaller builders still stymied by an inability to raise adequate finance to access extremely expensive building land. And that goes back to the 1961 Act that needs to be reversed. So we do need to make planning simpler, but that won't solve the problem of accessing reasonably priced land. The only way you can take the speculative heat out of the market for land is by reversing that 1961 Act and by properly sharing the planning gain, which makes it far less advantageous to sit on potential land for decades and even generations. And by the way, once we share planning uplift more systematically, we can then scrap the tortuous Section 106 agreements, a lawyer's bonanza paid for by you, under which builders are supposed to make contributions to local infrastructure and affordable housing. These S106 agreements, they often make developments impossible for the smaller builders, while the larger developers, and I've got copious examples of this in my book, they routinely muscle their way out of these S106 contracts with local authorities desperate to get homes built, cowed into submission by the big players in the house building industry. Number five, manifesto for point number five, the green belt. Now the green belt surrounding London, for instance, while it protects the rolling hills of the Chilterns, also covers countless litter strewn railway sidings and areas of scruffy urban wasteland. Outdated green belt classifications are too often being used to limit the development of sites in areas of intense housing demand that are far from green and pleasant. And it's not being concreted over, whatever people tell you, because Greenbelt acreage, believe it or not, I can show you the sums, has more than doubled since 1979. It's more than twice as big as it was across the country, the Greenbelt, since 1979. The Greenbelt is now 13% of the entire land mass of England. And that doesn't include areas of outstanding natural beauty and national parks. This is just the Greenbelt, 13%. While the share of England that's covered by homes, including gardens, is 2%. I've done the sums. 2% compared to 13%. That's why there's more acreage in Surrey devoted to golf courses than to housing. Fact. It's urgent, in particular, that we reclassify Greenbelt in locations close to public transport, particularly in the southeast adjacent to Crossrail, which of course goes from Berkshire to Essex across London, but everywhere else as well. Releasing just 5% of the Greenbelt will create the space required to clear the UK's vast backlog of shortage of homes entirely. Just 5% of the Greenbelt, and, even building at low, and that's even building at low density. You'd need less if you could build at higher densities. And even then, if you use 5%, the Greenbelt would still be more than twice as big as it was in 1979. In its current form, the Greenbelt acts as a huge and growing distortion on a market for land, which is already deeply dysfunctional. It's basically, in the words of one LSE professor, an ethnic cleansing mechanism for people in the home counties to keep people out that they don't like. We need to so stop severely constraining uh, the growth of housing in places where people want and live to need, uh, need to live. Yet the Johnson administration has just pledged to protect unquestionably as holy writ all existing Greenbelt. Number six, new build homes. Now I've told you why I don't like help to buy, which since 2013 has handed the all power, powerful housing developers huge profits by channeling often young buyers into substandard new build homes. But consider another aspect of buying a brand new home, which absolutely blew my mind when I found out about it. And I've literally checked this with multiple planning and surveyors and lawyers and professionals in the house building industry. And I've even made a television documentary that includes this fact. So, you know, they haven't sued me. This is fact. And it reflects the massive power of the house builders and the reluctance of successive governments to regulate them. Maybe because developers give so many millions each year 
to, in political donations. But here it is. Housing developers are not required by law, they're not required by law, to allow buyers of new build homes to conduct their own independent survey before completion. So they often don't. They often make desperate buyers of new build homes sign sales and purchase agreements, which waive their right to have an independent survey on their home. And that's, that's, that's a legal thing to do. That's completely mad. It's currently the case that those purchasing new build homes, often the biggest and most important transaction of their lives, are not legally entitled to conduct their own independent survey. So as I've said, given ongoing shortages and rampant demand, big developers often simply prevent them from doing so. So home buyers in such cases, buying new build homes, they enjoy less consumer protection buying their home than if they were buying a, a toaster. Than if they were buying a toaster. The severe lack of legal safeguards for people buying new build homes is a sad indictment, ladies and gentlemen, of the market power of the UK's house builders and their ability to resist the most basic legislation regulating their product. And if you want to look on the dispatches website, you can watch a documentary, Britain's New Build Scandal, by me, which was lawyered to within an inch of its life about a spate of new build homes being built by these big developers under help to buy without adequate fire safety protection, without passing building regs, a whole woeful mess of substandard homes have been sold under help to buy by over mighty big developers who dominate local markets and dominate the market overall. Manifesto point number seven, what I call the great British sell-off. So the public sector owns about 6% of all freehold land in this country, almost a million, and that rises to 15% in urban areas, including countless prime sites for redevelopment. For instance, in Brighton, the state owns over two fifths of all freehold land. In Barking and Dagenham, it owns the same over two fifths of all freehold land and in six other local authority hotspots. And they're only the ones that I managed to find why, while researching my book. The state holds enormous amounts of land in very developable areas. Transport for London, for instance, owns around 6,000 hectares, uh, 6,000 acres, sorry, in the capital. Network Rail has substantial land holdings, often close to stations a useful place to build. The NHS has large land holdings. In a recent report, NHS Digital identified surplus land across 550 sites in towns and cities. And if the state released on my calculations just 1 20th of its land for development, that would be enough at the current UK average density of 45 homes per hectare to build well over 2 million homes and far more if that state hold land is in urban areas, as much of it is and is used at a higher building density. This debate has gone on for years and years and years. Why won't the state sell more land? Well, the answer is Whitehall torpor and incompetence. The sale of public land for residential building has been hopelessly, tortuously slow, and that needs to end. Item eight, two to go. Land ownership transparency. This country has a remarkably opaque system of land ownership. I kid you not, the picture was clearer when we wrote the doomsday book. There's much scope to increase the tra transparency of land supply through the compulsory release of detailed data on land market activity. You don't even have to register when you buy and sell land in this country it, through options agreements. Better data will create a more level playing field. It will enable small and medium sized enterprises to find sites more easily. It should be a legal requirement to let register land transactions and the options agreements that large developers often use to tie the hands of farmers with land to sell. Again, that would enhance the operation of the market for land. And the final manifesto point is industry structure before I bring my remarks to a close. The rapid consolidation of the UK house building industry since the global financial crisis and the sharp increase in build out delays amounts to circumstantial evidence of deliberately anti-competitive 
behaviour. That's why the House of Lords in 2016, a committee comprising some of the top economists in this country, described the UK house building sector as having all the characteristics of an oligopoly. Large developers, they're operating in a sector which should be extremely competitive, involving long-standing and widely available technologies. They're building homes, they're not coding, they're not creating tech giants, yet they're chalking up huge profits at margins of 20, 25, 30% plus. These are not normal margins. They demonstrate anti-competitive behavior. That's why you're getting mediocre managers of regional house builders getting bonuses of 50 million pounds plus if they're, as if they're some kind of you know, entrepreneurial genius, geniuses. They're not. They're just overseeing what amounts to local oligopolies and I would say even cartels. This affordability crisis is preventing, ladies and gentlemen, more than half of an entire generation of young adults from buying a home while stymieing in the development of social housing too. These increasingly dominant developers, in large developers, in response to a taxpayer funded scheme to help young adults buy a home, they use that scheme to increase their market dominance while returning to archaic and abusive market practices such as selling substandard leaseholds on new build properties that were cynically punitive and have yet to be outlawed by this and successive governments. And as such, I would say an immediate competition of markets authority, CMA inquiry, that's the successor to what used to be the Office for Fair Trading, is now long overdue into the structure of the UK house building industry. And the fact that such an inquiry hasn't yet happened when the evidence is so screamingly obvious is itself a sign of the unhealthy and entirely disproportionate influence that this powerful lobby exerts over our elected representatives. So in conclusion, the central argument of Home Truths is that we need radical reforms to the supply side of the UK housing market, particularly our opaque and deeply dysfunctional market for land. At present, landowners and large developers who increasingly dominate the industry have every incentive to sit on their land holdings, even if they have planning permission. Yet relentless housing demand in the face of slow supply, slow supply pushes up land prices and ultimately the prices that home buyers must pay and developer profit margins even more. And over recent years, as local councils have granted more and more planning permissions, the clear and undeniable reality is that the big players now dominating housing supply have engaged in a deliberate building go slow, making higher profits overall by building fewer homes. Only bold action can break this low build, high price deadlock. Home Truths wants stiff fines for developers that unduly delay building once planning permission has been granted. When as I said, when residential planning permission is granted, land values rocket often more than one, two, three hundred fold. That vast gain should be systematically shared with the state, channeled into local infrastructure, making local house building more popular, revolutionizing local politics when it comes to planning. This happens in many other countries, France, Germany, much of the US, Australia, many Asian nations. It's an idea that goes back to Adam Smith and the Scottish Enlightenment and it used to happen here. The UK's post-war building boom was driven by legislation allowing land value capture by government, which damped down speculative demand for land, keeping the cost of building plots reasonable. This in turn allowed millions of relatively affordable homes to be built, underpinning what was then a truly competitive house building industry. One that was far more beneficial to home buyers with multiple building outfits competing on both quality and price rather than just a few over mighty operators as now stitching up land access and controlling the place, the pace at which homes are supplied. During the late fifties though, as I outline in Home Truths, the conservative pandered to big landowners and developers, passing a series of laws stymieing the use of land value capture, and ultimately the 1961 Land Compensation Act, allowing, ensuring that landowners and land holding developers were entitled the full land valuation upside when permission was granted. And this legislation is what's since rampant, fueled rampant speculative investment in building land and remains in place, place to this day, helping to drive our current affordability crisis and indeed 
the chronic lack of social housing. Since taking office in July 2019, Boris Johnson's clearly been pretty busy with Brexit and COVID, but I know from personal experience, he understands the social and political importance of building more homes. We need to build, 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 he declared in June 2020 and again last month. But this is just the very latest in a long line of promises by British governments of all political stripes to finally solve our housing crisis. Ministers know they need to fix housing, given that it's consistently high up on the issues among focus groups outlining voters' most pressing concerns. Yet there is at the time of writing, even allowing for the distraction of COVID, scant evidence this government is different to any of its predecessors, despite my efforts. During the year after June 2019, the Tories received more than 11 million pounds from some of the UK's leading developers, according to figures from the Electoral Commission. This deeply dysfunctional supply side of our house building industry suits the large house builders and landowners very well. It would be naive and wrong to ignore the potential influence of political donations on policy or the lack of appetite to introduce reforms, particularly when it comes to house building, a sector of such vital importance to so many millions. So as I conclude, here's a quotation. It is possible to solve our housing problem, remarked the late conservative philosopher, Sir Roger Scruton in May 2019, in an interview for the final chapter of Home Truths. But that requires, said Sir Roger, confrontation with vested interests. And an awful lot of those vested interests are, it has to be said, connected to the Conservative Party. But, but, it's not just the Tories. It was under Brown and Blair that council house building really flatlined. And when it came to Labour's review of our house building industry, who did they get to do it? The CEO of one of our biggest house builders, who of course said everything's fine. There's no shortage of homes, nothing to see here. And here's a political donation, an insult to the millions of young adults whose dreams of home ownership are being thwarted to say nothing of the additional millions suffering due to our chronic lack of social housing too. The chronic lack of housing in this country to buy, rent or for social housing has long been causing significant social and economic damage. Of rising political potency over the years, the deep deficiencies in our housing stock have become even more manifest during this COVID lockdown. Far from helping, our overly dominant commercial house builders operating within a system seemingly designed to put consumers at maximum disadvantage are compounding what is already a very serious problem. The causes behind our housing shortage are now so entrenched and the players involved so powerful that the low build, high price status quo can only be tackled, ladies and gentlemen, with a series of bold disruptive reforms. Thank you. Liam, <clears throat> absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you so much. Um, a very powerful uh, and profoundly insightful lecture. You were, I believe, in your youth, um, a member of the Labour Party football team. And I can tell you, I've known a number of members of that team over the years, but I've never known any member, quote, Adam Smith, or indeed, uh, Sir Roger Scruton. Uh, so I was our, only in the team because I was a good footballer. I wasn't a member of the Labour Party. Well, there we are, whatever. Um, I think what you've done for me is you've unpackaged so brilliantly and so eloquently a, a very corporatist knot. One of the mistakes many social scientists make, and I can say this, I have three degrees in sociology, um, uh, they make the mistake of assuming that, of course, entrepreneurs or people in markets, capitalists actually believe in competition and open and free markets. And as Adam Smith taught us in book 10 of the Wealth of Nations, it's quite the reverse. He said, uh, people of the same trade and profession seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but soon the conversation turns into a conspiracy against the public interest. We have a number of questions and before I move to them, I'd like to ask you, if I may, just Please. to kick us off two. One is, um, uh, in the spirit of Adam Smith and that conspiracy, 
To what extent do these ossified corporatist interests, these big builders, these powerful blocks that you describe, these people who fund political parties and 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 um, and and sort of get in with the elites of both the Conservative and the Labour Party, to what extent do they promote, dare I say it, things like the Green Belt and use the mantle or the cover fire of, of environmentalism to actually promote their own uh, rapacious uh, greed and desire to restrict supply to keep balance sheets and prices and all the rest of it um, buoyant. So that's my first question. And my second question um, is, you talked right at the end there about something profound happening, something really big needing to shake up this discourse. Of course, Thatcherism was to an extent a product of the IMF loan of 1976. You know, Britain's political elite left and right had simply run out of road. The civil service didn't really know what to, to do. And Thatcher came with a team of outsiders from the classical liberal tradition to open up British industry to more competitive global forces. And in time, Blair took that forward with, with the human services. Could this pandemic, could the level of debt that we now have in Britain, uh, put aside the rest of Western civilization at the moment, could those levels of debt, uh, could COVID be a catalyst for this? I, what I'm saying is I was in the city of London last week. I, I couldn't believe how dead it was. All those offices were literally empty. I stood in front of the corn exchange and I looked around me and there was one bus and two taxis and there were about five pedestrians. Could this be a moment where we rezone things like um, office blocks, mm. uh, push them into domestic housing and, and you know, where's our IMF moment, as it were, <laughs> uh, to, to, to deliver the big bang moment that you, th you were suggesting at the end there that we need? So those are my two questions. Very good, thank you, Tim. Um, so I, I don't think I don't think the the I mean yeah, it's well documented how big corporate interests use so-called astroturf public relations, creating you know, public relations lobbying organisations to promote certain things which are handy to them, pretending there's you know a grassroots movement there where there isn't. Um, but they don't really need to in the case of the green belt because so many you know ordinary people you know. Uh, want the green belt to be maintained and and look what what I think's a, a crime is when you have you know tiny little infill sites in villages and they whack four houses on them that's that's crazy if you have, you know build three new towns and we're sorted right <laughs> yeah. um again lots of people are very sniffy about Milton Keynes well I've you know I'm from an Irish background I've got 24 first cousins and four of them moved to Milton Keynes when I was a kid so I spent a lot of summers there and, you know, they were really happy to leave some crappy, you know, masonette in, in a bad part of London and go to Milton Keynes with a garden and a decent school where their kids could ride a bike and, you know, look at a cow. Um, so let's not be sniffy about this. I, I, I do think because we're not thinking big about housing, it's sort of, it's sort of death by a thousand cuts, if you know what I mean. We're, 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 we are doing really quite, um, um, anti-aesthetic things in some small towns and villages because we're not really grabbing the situation and using land value capture to actually drive that engine of land value capture which has been used literally since the Egyptian times. It's where the phrase fat of the land comes from in the Bible, believe it or not. And that's why, where one of the, that's where um, uh, the chapter I've got in Home Truths about really drive that really digs into the history of land value capture is called fat of the land for, for, for that for that reason um so so you know i don't begrudge ordinary people who don't want you know a bunch of boxy persimmon homes at the end of their lovely country lane in berkshire that they've worked their backsides off all life all their lives to live in i don't begrudge them not wanting that but i say that we do need to build a lot more homes given the massive shortage and a lot of that can be dealt with by new towns built on often, you know, state land that's repackaged, as I've said, it can build the infrastructure as well. Um, 
and in particular districts and localities if building homes brings with it a massive you know wedge of cash uh, and and worth that local authorities can borrow against and then build the infrastructure so it's there when the homes are built so there isn't this sort of 10 year period where you can't get your kid into the local primary school because there's a new housing development you know, if these things happen simultaneously and that's what land value capture can do you will completely change the politics of, of local planning um uh now 76 of course was britain's i mean i've referred to it in the past in my writing as as our economic suez because it was the moment where the the the, the that you can use that if you want um the <laughs> the scales really came off and I'm just about old enough to remember 1976 because you know again as a London Irish kid I spent most of my early summers in in the west of Ireland and I remember hearing a bunch of Irish farmers scoffing about it you know the fact that the Brits had to borrow off the Americans oh I'm not so clever now other yada yada you can imagine the conversation of course I, I took no part in it um I was just serving pints behind the bar when I was five you know that's what happens in the west of Ireland um but this is, of course, a, a, an unfrozen moment, I think. So, look, this was always going to be, Tim, you know, post-Brexit was always the B word, first mentioned, was always going to be, you know, the most vigorous period of policy making since the Thatcher era, when you and I grew up, because of all the competences that are returning. You know, you can set your own VAT rates, you can set your own um, regional policy, uh, you can do all kinds of things uh, that are very, very difficult under uh, the ACQUI, the uh, European Union membership. And so there was, there's always going to be, in my previous book, Clean Brexit, I mean, the back half of that is all about things that you can do under Brexit that you can't do before Brexit, good and bad. Um, and, and Boris has completely failed to take up any of that kind of agenda, like, the what is Brexit for agenda, not just because people said we need to do it, which is a good enough reason in most people's eyes, even lots of reconciled Remainers. Um, but, you know, what are the benefits, the policy benefits, the things we can do that will boost growth, not just a regulatory race to the bottom, uh, but positive using tax incentives, using uh, all kinds of competences returning. So this is always going to be a major moment in, in UK policy making. But if you then add to that, post-Brexit world, the fact that the Tories have won like 35, 40 seats in the red wall that they really need to retain, you've then got the levelling up thing, right? So that makes it, you know, Thatcher plus, not necessarily in the direction, but I'm talking about the the, 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 the sort of drive to, to, to build new reforms, the drive to change policy. You've got post-Brexit, you've got levelling up, you're then into a really vibrant policy making environment and it it won't all be you know as i've said a, a regulatory race to, to the bottom as some people would characterize the 80s it will be many things but then if you put on top of that covid as well we are in a sort of 1945 to 1948 moment yeah we are in a new jerusalem and by the way boris nicked that whole paragraph in his recent leader speech straight out of my sunday telegraph column six weeks before yeah, that we are in a new Jerusalem situation where there is a huge animus towards, you know, policy upheaval and policy renewal. There's the need for that. And I wonder if this government has got the kind of intellectual bandwidth and the political grit and determination to do it. And housing is the litmus test, right? Housing is the most important supply side reform that this government should do. And that's certainly what people senior in government, people, you know, before um, recent events, you know, people like Boris, Javid, um, Liz Truss, they, they totally get this. Um, at least they tell me that they totally get it. And yet the policy reforms that we've seen from them, you know, a bit of lip wristed stuff on planning, really, and the wrong stuff on planning, because it's not about bullying constituents, Tory constituencies into doing what you want. It's about incentivizing them. So, you know, the politics of local planning changes. It's about it's about making sure that the big house builders have to act in a in a competitive way. I mean, I don't blame the CEOs. You know, it's their legal obligation to maximize profits in the current system. I do not blame the CEOs. I mean, I think they're pretty crass and callous. Uh, and in fact, I have had 
a, a stream of retired housing executives, very senior, talked to me since Home Truth saying, you're spot on, son, keep going. Uh, I had Tony Pidgeley in my book, one of the most successful housing developers in British history, actually give me an interview for the book where he backs everything that I've said in my policy manifesto. Unfortunately, since I wrote Home Truths and before the paperbacks camp came out, he actually died a couple of, couple of months ago. And so I put a, a tribute to him in the book. He's the guy that built Barclay Homes. Um, nothing to do with the bank. They're just the fourth biggest housing developer in yeah. Britain. And they've generally been a lot more, a lot less sort of restrictive than the, than the other big four, big five uh, house builders. So I do think there is an opportunity here. I think the country's screaming out for policy changes, but I, even though it may alter the shape of the housing market, so, you know, downtown penthouses will be less valuable, but, you know, frankly, houses in the suburbs with nice grief fields ne nearby, houses in market towns that are commutable to London, houses even, you know, if, you, if you're looking at, you know, you might want to uh, com live in London three days a week and live with your, you know, your brother's family or something. Those houses will go up. It doesn't alter the fact that we've still got far too many people chasing far too few homes. And by the way, I don't blame that on immigration. There's a whole section in the book on immigration. You know, build more homes. Yeah. You know, 2% of the land mass is homes and 13% is Greenbelt. France, actually, and there's there's... It's one of those moments when the scales fall from your eyes. I remember writing this section and, and re re researching this section, and I personally think it's one of the best sections of the book where I compare France to Britain over the last 40 years. And there was an awful lot of digging out statistics from French state databases and building my own spreadsheets. But basically I established that France and Britain over the last 40 years, they've had similar amounts of immigration. Actually, France has had more. Um, <laughs> Um, and yet, um, real house prices in France have kept in line with earnings growth, and in Britain, they've sparred way ahead of earnings growth. It's because France has built more homes. Yeah. And then you say, oh, but France is bigger. Yes, but we've got tons of space. 2% of our land mass is homes. 2%. We can build more homes, and we desperately need to build more homes. And maybe, Tim, this COVID moment this post-covid moment where as i said at the outset the advantages and disadvantages of either living in a decent place with a spare room and outside space uh, and space for your you know guests to stay over and living in cramped accommodation in a high rise that's substandard and the elevator never works um never in living memory has that gulf been brought home more powerfully than during this lockdown Brilliant. Okay, Liam, thank you for that. Um, um, uh, Tom Burroughs has a point here. He says, one point to make is that because we have a planning system that can be gamed, uh, we need some interventions to shift the supply and demand equation the other way, which is why land value capture point really makes sense in this context. So that's the supporter there. Um, someone else says, uh, Keith Boyfield says, totally support what Liam has to say about erratic record of public land sales. Yeah. Um, someone else says, Liam is getting a stat, and I enjoyed this, a tad statist with his recommendations. You don't often hear someone who's actually erring on the side of dramatic supply side reforms and trying to undermine corporatism being called a, stat, a tad statist. With his recommendations on public development corporations, who is going to build all these new homes? We suffer from a chronic, chronic lack of building skills. We have to recruit from Eastern Europe. This hooks into your point perhaps about um, <laughs> immigrants and, 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 and also the adjunct issue of skills, etc. cetera. You, you've made many points tonight about incentivizing supply side reform. Surely that question there about skills falls under the issue of the incentives. You get the incentives right, the skills and the people and the profits will follow. So thank you um, for those questions. I should I should mention that um, I, I thoroughly recommend Keith Boyfield's research and pamphlets that he's written on the housing market, which I which helped to me to write my book. So thank you, Keith. This statist argument is very interesting, isn't it? Anytime you 
anytime you advocate, you know, the slightest departure from, you know, the, the, the law of the jungle, apparently, you know, you're, 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 you're a left wings, you know, yogurt munching, sandal wearer. I mean, this, with all respect, this is just mad. Okay. You know, we, we had the 1844 Bank Charter Act because untrammeled banking was, you know, anarchic. You know, we had the poor laws because untrammeled employment of labor was frankly deeply exploitative. You know, you know, I'm a former fund manager. You know, I've, I've written a column in the Telegraph for over 20 years. I like financial markets. There's not another you know, mainstream national newspaper columnist who spent more time in the money markets that, than me, frankly, uh, who's still a front, who is now a front, and has been a frontline journalist. And, and I would say in my defense, this, you know, in, in some, and I said it several times, in some American states, they use land value capture. In Hong Kong, they use land value capture. In Singapore, they use land value capture. In the Netherlands, they use land value capture. In Australia, they use land value capture. In New Zealand, they use land value capture. And when that 1961 act came in, I unearthed the cabinet minutes because there was one young member of the cabinet who was so alarmed at that act because he realized, very clever guy, he realized that this would lead to rampant speculation in land markets. It, he realized, and he used the phrase, it's a return to feudal Britain. And he realized it would crush eventually the home ownership dream of countless British people. And his name was Keith Joseph. Keith Joseph, yeah, whose credentials as a free marketeer are impeccable. And of course, he went up to set went on to set up the Centre for Policy Studies, and become Mrs. Thatcher's main intellectual ally, the Thatcherite before Thatcher. The Tory Party has a problem. In that, it has part of the part of its part part of its party, the more ideological part, who thinks that these ideas are indeed statist. But being pro markets doesn't always mean being pro big business. It often means precisely the opposite. And if you don't believe me, you know, read some history, read the history of uh, 1890s and 1900s in America and the run up to the Sherman Act and then the breakup of Standard Oil and the other huge combinations, if you like, that dominated the markets. Unless you occasionally reform capitalism and give it a kick in the shins, you will lose public consent for capitalism. We are losing public consent for a system at the moment, Tim, which doesn't deliver for far too many of our people, particularly the young. So we can say, oh, let's just let the free market do whatever it wants. Uh, I would say let's use the free market to get the outcomes that we need. And that means every now and then, every generation, any responsible political and media and policy making class needs to have a spate of antitrust in order not to prevent competition, but to enable and release and engender competition. The housing building industry at the moment is not capitalism. It's not capitalism that some- corporatism. Uh, I, I'm listening to you. Gets a 75 million pound bonus for building crap homes. Indeed, I'm listening to you, Liam, and actually, um, you've given me a flashback to when I returned um, from Czechoslovakia in the early 90s, having been the uh, Soviet Prime Minister's head of policy in it and chief economic and political advisor to the government. And I pushed through with the cabinet and the prime minister and the government an ocean of supply side reforms. And there was one occasion in London where I was giving a talk about the reforms I'd been involved in and a rather pointy headed, um, individual in an audience told me I'd been uh, a tad statist uh, because um, when we had pushed through some privatizations in some sectors, the capital receipts had gone to the state. And I'm watching you with the sort of veracity and power that I gave uh, that commentator um, um, all those years ago. Um, You've talked about the Tory party, you've talked about vested interests, and you've talked about the inertia. Um, and you've also talked about your scepticism that while people like this trust or the prime minister get um, what has to be done, somehow they just don't have the elbow room, the, the, um, 
the the the, the nouse or or I'm not singling out Liz. I think she actually no, no. does. Okay. I think she, I think she does. Okay, but I think but she, she, she one of the, but one of the big mistakes we all make is that often we think of governments as controlling political discourse, and of course, of course, oppositions have a huge impact on what government does. Um, you mentioned earlier because you're a good supply cider, and you you are steeped in various aspects of classical liberal economics. Mm. Um, you you made a throwaway remark earlier, and a couple of people are picking up on this. They're always the dangerous ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you, you you referenced George, you know, the work yeah. of Henry George. Yeah. We live in interesting times when the former Labour um, shadow chancellor, John McDonnell, obviously a funny mixture himself, partly um, informed by Marx, partly informed by Trotsky, but also when it came to land and land value, yeah. very much actually um, a believer of the, the ideas of Henry George. Yeah. You've obviously looked at the ideas of Henry yeah. George and you've rejected a lot of them. Yeah. There are some interesting kernels of truth there. Absolutely, there are. And real timeless conundrums. When you mention the Egyptians or you mention, I don't know, the 1844 Act, banking, or indeed, I think it was the 1842 Act, which introduced the limited laws of liability yeah. as interventions in the market. Yeah. These are timeless conundrums that political economists have to deal with. That's right. I mean, the thing about, you know, I mean, John McDonnell and, you know, they want to evoke the ideas of Henry George to have a recurring annual, a recurring annual wealth tax. I mean, you know, in a Georgist society, there is no other tax apart from land value tax. It's, uh, it's and that's why he called it in his classic, which is actually a best selling book of the year. <laughs> Henry George has an incredible life. <laughs> uh, we, we can talk about that another time. Um, yeah, he called it the single tax. I'm not. I'm not going for some kind of John McDonnell, you know, Georges utopia at all. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's just because you mention the idea of an economist doesn't mean that you you totally take on board every single aspect of his agenda. What I am saying, and I was very careful how I phrased it, even in my you know, rather ramshackle lecture, but particularly in my in my book. Um, you know, I said a targeted variant of the land value tax, and it applies only, doesn't apply to everybody, you don't get rid of all other taxation, it applies only to developers in the particular instance where they own building land and they've got planning permission on it, which blocks smaller builders from getting that planning permission, lets the local authority tell Whitehall it's completed its housing plan for that year, and so uses that planning permission, by the way, to enhance the balance sheet, because then their stock price goes to the moon, not just because they got the ability to build. It represents the ability on their balance sheet to stop others from building, which enhances the margin. Talk to, as I say, any equity analyst that knows what they're talking about in this sector. So you, you circumvent that absolute blockage on competition, that deeply anti-capitalist move to stop the industry as a whole responding to the price signal yeah you use the georgist idea of a land value tax in that specific instance to that specific uh, agent in the economy for a specific amount of time to stop them doing that now if that's too statist for you then you know you want to go and live on a desert island all on your own and good luck with that this is not statist this is allowing competition to happen. The Sherman Act, 1890s America, was not statist. It allowed competition to happen. Limited liability laws, the Bank Charter Act, the poor laws, they were not statist. They allowed competition to happen by either enabling it of its own right or creating or, or preventing you know, such political fallout from the market untrammeled that we would have ended up with deeply counterproductive far far more status measures and that's where we are unless the tories fix this right you are going to get you know frankly economically illiterate people on the other side going for proper rent controls proper massive wealth taxes you know spitefully driven uh deeply anti-competitive policies that mean you get fewer houses being built uh and the standard of those houses goes down even more. This is not a statist agenda, 
and quite frankly anyone that says it is either doesn't understand or is keen on re retaining a status quo that is deep very beneficial for a, you know just a small number of people rather than broader society so if you um had access to Keir Starmer and you were advising I do have access to <laughs> no, sorry go on. <laughs> that's great so and if you were talking to him and the, and, the, and the Labour Party housing team yeah. about something that is more measured, more balanced, more, yeah. dare I use the word, inclusive, yeah. and therefore more electorally viable as, as, a, as a way, you know, of untying this knot, this corporatist knot in your yeah. terms. Um, what would you say, and what do you think could be realistic um, for, you know, to what extent do you think your ideas will fly with with the Labour Party moving forward? Because I repeat, oppositions can have a huge impact on... Well, on I'd, the government. Yeah, I'd, I'd much rather they flew with the Conservative Party uh, because, you know, you know, most of the time, I think you know, that they, they got a better understanding of economics, though off, quite often not. Um, but out, throughout history, if you introduce a sort of proper, you know, sharing of land value capture right yeah um, we've tried it in the part when we, we had it Atley introduced it but he introduced it it was too much he went for a hundred percent of the upside goes to the state which of course meant that no one brought any land forward which then you had awful you know dog fights cpos at a time post-war reforms were you know hammering lots of landowners anyway you know there's that famous song by the kinks which a <laughs> sunny afternoon which describes which describes all that a cultural reference there um, but if Labour introduces reforms like this then the, the land market just waits for the Tories to get in and reverse them and that's happened yeah. three or four times throughout the 60s and 70s um, uh, but if a Conservative Party introduces these reforms then the market knows that they're for keeps yeah and then you'll actually respond so more land will come forward um, and there's no incentive or a lot less incentive than to just sit on the land for for generations and let the surrounding community suffer uh, and ordinary people you know paying eye-watering mortgages or having to move out of the area so they can't see their generations of their family and, and all the rest of it so i mean but lab so so labor over the years have had a very smart guy doing their housing called john healy and he's been kept in post for a long time and 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 he largely agrees with a lot of what's in home truth but by the way so does sajid javid yeah right. i mean it's hot off the press sajid javid has written the foreword for the, the 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 paperback in which he basically backs everything i've just said and in fact he backs a lot of what i said in the original book uh on splitting planning game 50 50. i mean it was on the front page of the, of the telegraph when the book was published um and also wanting more state lands to come forward acknowledging that developers have a stranglehold the large developers have a stranglehold you know acknowledging that we need antitrust in in this area Unless the Tories do it delicately and with skill and precision and in not a spiteful way, then the delay between now and then doing it will mean that Labour will definitely do it in a spiteful way that will be counterproductive. And it will be along with, you know, a return to rent controls and all that madness of the of the 50s and 60s that um, was such a problem. But it was less of a problem then because we have much more housing stock compared to our population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and while immigration then was culturally important, you know, people like my family and the Windrush generation, you know, lots of Irish coming over, lots of people coming over from the Commonwealth and doing their thing in the UK and making us what we are, there was just more housing stock. Yeah. Um, now there's a real tightness of housing stock. So those punitive measures are likely to be even more punitive and spiteful. So you know, get your changes in early before the situation gets even more desperate. That's what I would say. And, you know, what you're actually doing is, and I, I missed the, the thing out on skills, you know, so I'm all, almost all my cousins are builders, right? My sibling, you know, everyone I grew up with. And I know there's an awful lot of people with building skills at the moment who are driving cabs uh, and are doing other stuff. Um, and it doesn't take that long to take, you know, a, a smart youngster out of school and, you know, stick them on an apprenticeship. And within six months, you can lay bricks pretty well within within 12 months, you know, you've got the rudiments of plumbing and, and, and being an electrician. Uh, it's not rocket scientists. You need those skills. You can't, you can't busk it. Of course you can't. You need to be taught. But there are plenty of youngsters who would do that, both from, you know, people who've been here for generations 
and from the immigrant community too. Brilliant. Um, a couple of brief questions from people. Uh, one from Kim Raymond. Uh, she says her question is, what are your views, Liam, on micro homes? Mm -hmm. And does he feel that a minimum standard of living is more important than floor space? Uh, another question um, is, what would drive up building standards in your view? And I think they're sort of related because they're, they're about quality here. Yeah, how do we raise building standards for new builds? And is there a political appetite for a public inquiry on housing and the cartels you describe? Okay, so on microhomes, this, this, I mean, in, in the book, I, I really rail against, um, and, and quite a lot of journalism since has built off the evidence in the book about how permitted development rights have been used to build really, really nasty homes, often in substandard buildings. In general, you know, relying on permitted development rights, the so-called so difference between housing completions, that um, ministry time series, and new dwellings, Ministers always quote new dwellings because it includes converted shops, right. you know, house split into flats, um, and you know converting office buildings under PDR. Uh, you can only convert an office building or a shop once. This doesn't point to a sort of systematic increase in our sort of house building capacity and 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 the, the system allowing higher. You know, we, we need we need more homes every year like forever <laughs> um not yeah uh, um so I, I and also what's under the 2013 and 2014 legislation under pdr permanent development rights um there is no minimum space um ridiculously uh and then you don't have any affordable housing or other s106 commitments well i've, I've argued against them if you've got housing capture happening so I do think the system has been seriously abused, the business development rights system. That's why some councils have actually stopped in their local authorities because they've been building you know, vertical slums with, as I say, already substandard buildings being converted into nasty homes. Look, office conversions can work. I'm not, I'm not sniffy about this. They, they can work, but often they don't. So I'd much rather see um, you know, more sustained increase in house building rather than using permitted development rights to you know to fend off for another electoral cycle proper reform which is what they're being used to do now um, um and i you know the thing about micro homes yes they can work but not if that's all that the kids can buy you know yeah if, if micro homes are the only thing that we do then people are going to end up paying you know 300 400 grand for far less meterage than they would get now. That's that's the point. They've got to be part of a broader solution of more house building and and, and the footage, the meterage that you're getting um, has to be reflected in the price rather than that average price per meter going through the roof because this is all that's available. That's, that's the point. Yep. Um, one question from Anne Elliott, who's a colleague at Middlesex. How much land or the equivalent number of houses are currently being held in unused land by the large developers. Do you have a sense of that? And another question from a, a guy who's a supporter of Middlesex called Tom Burrows. We hear a lot about younger adults being keener on renting than buying. Is that just a rationalisation of their plight or a genuine shift? Um, so, I mean, I've calculated that since... Um, um, as I said, since 2012, there have been um, almost a million planning permissions that have been granted that haven't been used. And, you know, before the, the, the big developers attack me again, you know, I, I do understand the concept of a land pipeline. You do need a pipeline, but, you know, you know one in two permissions not being used, that's not a pipeline. That's a restrictive practice um, by anyone's definition. Um, um, and as I said, it's really, really hard and you've got to be really, really connected. It's almost sort of, you know, meetings in a bus shelter with some civil servant in a Mac to get hold of these, the numbers, some of which I showed you here and which I cite in Home Truths. This should be absolutely front and centre. Every month, the ministry should be publishing land per permissions, outstanding permissions that are being built out because this is now a key metric the ministry uses the 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 the, the, the wheeze 
that they can't give us these numbers because these numbers are put together by consultants and it's part of their contractual obligation to the consultant that they can't give me the public who's paying for the numbers sight of the numbers so i literally have to get them off the record i mean they are the numbers but i can never say who gave them to me but i've got them um i mean it's just absurd complete madness it's all, that is in itself a restrictive cool. practice so, so that's a big problem and i'd say to tom i think you know repeated survey show you know, that there are many there are many opinion poll groups that will be paid by certain vested interests to get the answer that they want to surveys you know repeated survey show british social attitude survey so over many many years when given the choice people would rather own their own home that's not to say that renting doesn't work at certain periods in your life of course it does but if you look at the, the again there's a graph in 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 chapter two of home truths called you know the housing market in in 12 graphs and one of the graphs is really quite astonishing i think it shows a, a series of the amount of people in a, in rented accommodation by age in the mid 90s and now now was 2017 because the data i could get and in the mid 90s um at the age of uh, 28 which was the uh, sorry 27 which was the age average age at which women had their first child in 1990s in mid 90s 15 percent of those women were living in rented accommodation people at the age of 27 just 15 percent were living in rented accommodation uh, the average age of first child is now 28, gone up a tiny bit. Uh, the percentage of those women aged 28 now living in rented accommodation is 43%. Now, I know I have received dozens of emails from ordinary people who've read Home Truths over many years of journalism investigating this issue. There are so many kids who are not having kids themselves who are putting their lives on hold because they are in rented accommodation. If you give people the choice, most of the time they will say, of course, I want to buy a home. Why would I pay someone else's mortgage with my rent when I can pay my own? Now, there are an awful lot of, frankly, twisted polling results out there. And there are ministers are saying, oh, don't be so condescending. People may want to rent. What? You don't know what they want. Rubbish. If people have the chance to buy a home and own something at the end of it and have some flexibility and take advantage of gradually rising or sharply rising house prices then of course they will it's a complete no-brainer brilliant um lim if we may another question um and before i go into this question you're very good at lifting the lid on the underlying institutional architecture oh. with so-called capitalism you mentioned you various acts in the 1840s and all the rest of it so we're going to delve now into um fiat funny money qe right. and and probably the links between the nature of money the, the fractional reserve banking system and its impact on housing. So Oliver says, thank you very much for your very informative presentation. You're welcome. Your work will have necessary impact. You mentioned that the Bank of England's QE has slowed down the increase of real estate prices. I wondered if QE can weaken the currency, leading to an erosion of purchasing power, thus making home ownership more expensive. And if QE can lead to an advantage of a large of large developers over the small and mid-sized companies as large developers might have better access to cheaper loans. Could you therefore explain your comment in more detail, please? Uh, there's a really long uh, conversation and I've, I've, I've written, you know, Google my name and QE. I've written literally dozens of columns about it and, and yep. so on. Um, maybe I, I was clumsy in my expression, but what I wanted to say is that you know QE is part of the explanation why house prices have grown, um, you know. But the it's not, and the Bank of England um, put out a research report which I cite in QE. I don't agree with their econometric modelling. Uh, I don't agree with the parameters that they've they've used and the way that they've stacked up their model. But when they stick their finger in the air and and, and think about it, they reckon around a fifth of the price rises. I think since. Uh, 2007 is because of QE, that money end, ending up in the, in the housing market. Um, I think it's a bit less than that. I, um, I think it's partly it. I think it's mainly the, the, the concentration of the house building industry and our failure to build more homes at a time when the population's obviously been rising for all kinds of, 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 of reasons. So QE has, um, it, but it's not the explanation. 
um, because we've had QE everywhere and it's the UK is totally an outlier in terms, and we've had low interest rates everywhere and the UK is totally an outlier in terms of how rapidly house prices have soared ahead of earnings. I mean, I, I think in general, we're, we're in a very dangerous place with quantitative easing. We're now getting, you know, serious economists, you know, realizing that this is the way the wind is blowing and they better get on the right side of the argument otherwise they won't get their access to their politicians and all the rest of it mm. qe has sense has friends in very high places you know no city economist can argue against qe because of course qe is massively in, uh, beneficial if you already own shares stocks and bonds right because it's pushed up bond prices and it's pushed up share prices so yeah no city economist is going to argue against QE. Most journalists who write about economics don't really know any economics. Um, so they take their cue off city economists who they often went to college with. Um, so it becomes like a sort of echo chamber of, of course, QE is a good thing. And anybody that wields any historical references or actually thinks about it is dismissed as an idiot because, you know, why, why are you going to ruin the party? This is great. And we've got a whole generation now of traders that don't understand that markets can actually correct. Um, so this is a major problem. Uh, and now, you know, I think it's a big mistake that the Bank of England is flirting with negative, not just real interest rates. We've had negative real interest rates for years because the interest rate is lower than the rate of inflation, but negative nominal interest rates. So properly going through the looking glass, you know, the, these, the, these massively undermined bank balance sheets. These are a huge dis. They may juice up financial markets for a few more months. But out in the real world, people that run, you know, on the ground businesses outside of financial services and trading, this this kind of very, very extreme monetary policy is spooking a lot of people. And it's the reason there's a lack of real world investment out there, because, you know, ordinary businessmen and women who aren't, you know, don't spend their life in the square mile trading money, they actually, you know, manufacture real things and provide real services um uh, that they are deeply disenchanted in many cases and concerned by this very extreme monetary policy and i think it's long been counterproductive we should be moving away from quantitative easing we should be having a coordinated uh, effort around the world to raise interest rates and get back to positive real interest rates uh, return to, we haven't yet recovered from the financial crisis in that sense uh, this is warping financial markets you've got you know trillions of dollars worth of bonds around the world neg uh, yielding negative yields and that totally warps all incentives and it warps capitalism to say nothing of the fact that you've now got an enormous equity and bond market bubble Yep. Uh, and we know what happens to bubbles and we know who suffers most when those bubbles burst. It's yep. ordinary people who, having seen, you know, the clever people bugger it up, you know, two or three times in the last 20 years and have big crashes. They're not going to be um, uh, particularly amused when it happens again. You mentioned earlier price signals and you mentioned um, Keith Joseph and, of course, yeah. uh, both Friedrich von Hayek and his tutor Ludwig von Mises and the wider Austrian school were devotees of the language of price. You've now spent a few minutes very eloquently um, describing the incentives um, that are laid on most professional and, and city economists. Uh, we can park perhaps people like Detlev Schlichter and his interesting book, which argues that what it says in the title, Paper Money Collapse, that, that, that we could be live, living in an era that may eventually, in grand narrative terms, be leading to some uh, debt write-offs or indeed corrections or indeed paper money collapses. So let's just park that for a minute. Really good question here from Alex. Um, Liam, uh, would either a Labour or Conservative government ever agree to your reforms? And then the next question, do we need a proper socialist government to have any hope no i, I don't i don't to, to be honest tim you know the idea of a socialist government doesn't fill me with hope um what fills me with hope is a is a you know economically literate responsible government that 
uses the government's balance sheet and even the central bank's balance sheet in a responsible way. Um, uh, you know, a, a government isn't quite a household. It's a bit like a household, but with extra abilities. Um, I, I do, you know, so so in my, in my book, as I've said, you know, there are, I've got pretty much full agreement from a bloke that was business secretary and then home secretary and then chancellor. Um, Oliver Letwin comes on the record to agree with most of what I say in the book, going way beyond his original review for the government. Um, um, various developers who are in the twilight of their career, they've made their money. They agree with me that planning gain needs to be shared more um, evenly and more um, methodologically and significantly and transparently. So the whole community understands what will happen if these homes get built. And I say again, the UK is completely an outlier. Yeah. Um, the way we uh, fail to share planning uplift is almost unique in our country um, compared to other countries. It's, it's the reason why the UK's infrastructure spend is so low by international standards, below the OECD's kind of, you know, two, two and a half percent benchmark. It's because we don't get that big whack from planning uplift every year that they do in so many other countries so i think you know if if the tories want to win you know the cut the the party that solves this problem will be in a power for a long time and will deserve to be in power for a long time and if boris is serious about leveling up leveling up and he's serious about economic recovery every single recovery from recession tim in the last hundred years has been associated with a significant rise significant rise in house building every recovery from recession except the recovery since 2008. And it's been the slowest, most tepid recovery in our recorded history. I mean, in some ways we haven't really recovered. We've never really got our economic mojo back mm. since 28, uh, 2008. It's partly because of zombification of companies. It's partly because of the way the bank, central banks used its balance sheet. It's also because, you know, we haven't had that kind of building boom that really gets the sort of if you like the bottom three fifths of the economy moving in terms of income distribution which is what we followed the 29 crash there was an ocean of building in this country in the 1930s wasn't oh, it absolutely and it was it, it, i mean i won't i'll spare everyone the, the particular history um of, of of why it happened then that was when my childhood home home was built and there's lots about it in, in the book but we also you know basically before the Second World War, we didn't really have planning permission at all. It was it was sort of there, but you could get around it. But, you know, after the Town and Country Planning Act, after the war, we did have planning permission. But at the same time, we had this uplift share, which meant that things happened, you know, which meant that the homes could be built competitively once the permission was granted. We ended up sticking with the sort of dirigist planning permission, but without the bit that actually helps it to work. And so we've had this kind of completely dismembered planning system since 1961 with one half of the town and country planning act that stops you from building and, the, and without the other half of the town and country planning act that actually helps you to build um and that's 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 the problem and so if we can build more homes i think it can really help the economy um it's just sort of unarguably true um but also if boris is serious about leveling up then you know get local house building going you know get if you could say to a lot of people in these red wall seats you know your kid is either going to be able to buy a home or there's going to be decent social housing i mean fill your boots it'd be sure. a landslide it'd be, it'd be a landslide and for and not for cynical spin and manipulation reasons and you know kowtowing to populist memes and 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 our, and our, and our worst nature it will be appealing to our better nature we're going to use our enterprise and our skill and our people to build homes that are affordable by cutting through the thickets of these uh, obstacles to growth and progress as represented by you know huge vested interests which have nothing to do with capitalism except they are the byproduct of capitalism and they have been throughout centuries of human progress unless people come along from time to time and take the brickbats and show the intellectual grit and determination to get rid of them Brilliant. Liam, um, there's a funny comment that's coming from a colleague. I won't name the colleague, but they say, um, I signed on to Birmingham's council house list in 1977. 
I'm still waiting for them yeah. to get back to me. Yeah. Um, maybe that was a reply to Alex earlier with yeah. the idea that, I don't know, a centrally planned socialism uh, could work. Um, uh, uh, final couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, Leonard says, as a way forward to solve the housing crisis in between other reforms to build more social homes, how do you inspire the younger generation to, to, to know and to believe that they will be gifted the biggest value purchase um, in, in their life for free? How, how, how can you inspire young people to, I guess, get on the ladder and, 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 and to believe again? And then Mark says, what strategy do you, would you recommend for someone who wants to be an entrepreneur in the building space? You know, if, if you want to be a, perhaps even a self builder and build your own place, um, um, and that may be in, 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 in regard to finding some land or converting a property. Any insights there on yep. where the law actually still, maybe you can game these uh, laws and that you can still find a way through? Okay, so on, 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 on the younger generation, it, I mean, in, in, the, in the book, there's multiple interviews with you know, young adults trying to buy homes. And there's the, the most moving one by miles. And, uh, you know, it's... It, it is a young couple embarking yeah. and there's a, there's a young guy whose father's from Nigeria who came to London and this kid you know he's really good at maths and he teaches maths in one of our leading secondary schools in London um, yeah. and his his um, uh, fiance her parents came over uh, her grandparents came over from the Caribbean her parents uh, one was a he was a worked for BT as an electrical engineer she was a dinner lady. They bought this house in Barking where this young lady grew up. So you've got the, these, these two people, you know, she's, she's by the way, uh, a trainee lawyer, right? Having aced everything she's ever done at school. And he's a, he's a secondary school math teacher, right? Yeah. Both come from exemplary families. I met the parents um, and they can't buy the home. They can't buy a home. And as, and as the guy says, and he's almost crying when he says it, yeah, we're not asking anyone to give us a home. Yeah. We work hard. We've got our degrees. We do good work. We want the opportunity to buy a home so we don't have to pay rent. So I don't have to live in a bed set. So we can have a family. These are the people we should be trying to encourage. And, you know, and, and council housing too. I mean, I've never, you know, I've, unfortunately, both my grandparents died before. I was born on my mother's side, but my mum grew up in a council house, one of 10 children. And, you know, people died young in those days. And um, so I never met them, but I remember meeting and my, my mother's elder siblings and, and them saying to me the pride that they had when they got a council house, the pride that they could, that the council had accepted, that they should get a council house. And, you know, they, they didn't get it for free. They, they, they paid rent every week. They had to make the rent, but it was a subsidized rent, which meant people, you know, working class people with lower income jobs could still live in the city and do the things that needed to be done in the city. And I don't think that's a bad model. It doesn't mean it should be a third of people, which it was in 1979. I think that was too much. But I think when you've still got, going to Leonard's point, when you've got a council house waiting list, a million and a half strong, and you've got homelessness, aside from rough sleeping, that's gone up tenfold over the last 50 years as a share, which it has, then you've clearly got a social housing problem. And when your social housing bill is 25 billion a year recurring every year, and you're giving that money to landlords, and they're getting the capital gain, you know, build the houses, and they're on the state's balance sheet. Yeah. You know, if you can bring in some private sector money to do that and regulate the rents or the rate, the, the state can even borrow. I mean, it could be a revenue generator over the years, not to exploit vulnerable people, but if you've got a capital gain on the asset side and, and I mean, you borrow cheaply, it just strikes me as completely mad to not do that given the situation that we're in. And the quality doesn't need to be bad if you do the land reform so the local authority can buy the land or use its own land at a reasonable price. It's not a coincidence that we started building social housing in tower blocks in the 60s. It's, what's, what's happened with the 61 Act? And you take all the planning gain and give it to the landowner, so the, the, the land gets more expensive. That is not a coincidence that those tower blocks started then, after that law. And few people would say, while they work in some cases, 
few people would say that they've been an unalloyed success and some people with all due respect to people whose homes they are some people would say in some cases they're vertical slums yeah yeah liam um we've just straight over the two hours hmm. um there have been lots of questions we've got through a lot of them um, <laughs> you've been absolutely brilliant it's been wonderful uh can i say on behalf of all the viewers to have you coming home uh, to middlesex even though virtually um I never knew your story about the impact that, that our library had on you. Oh, when you, yeah. that, you were that young A-level student. There was a public library in Pimlico that I used at that age, and it provided me with the elbow room and the space to similarly, dare I say, start working, get my head down. It's yeah. amazing uh, what late starters can achieve in life. Um, but it's been an absolute delight and deeply grateful. And I'm particularly grateful for your balanced approach to this. Yes, you very much coming... Uh, from the supply side, but, but actually, um, I think hearing you, you're very much, um, you chime with the ethos of Middlesex University in that you don't sit comfortably with the usual people you find on left or right. You've lifted the manhole cover on these issues and you've dug deep and you've transcended the normal political discourse on this. And you've actually come up with some real world practical sort of vocational answers so really thank you for joining us um this evening i suppose when i think about social science economics business or political science all these interrelated areas i am drawn time and again back to a basic notion which you're tapping into the importance of property in and of the person because we have the right to self-ownership, the right to our own bodies, whether we pierce our ears or whatever we do, you know, that right of self-ownership um, is, is an important underlying factor of basic human rights. And then you have property of the person, property that's the product of people's labor, of which shelter, because that's what it is, is such an important and almost timeless part. And um, to bring that sort of left-wing aspect, if I call it like that, the issue of the human rights aspect, but also uh, the, economist, the, the economist bit of, the, of how do you actually supply and deliver and how do you assure the equality of the shelter is really important. But property rights in that sense, property in and of the person is so important. And you've been so brilliantly transcendent tonight, be it of the left, of the right, uh, and I thank you for it. So we'll leave it there. I know this has been recorded um, and I hope it's watched by many, many hundreds or thousands of people over the months and years ahead. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tim. And thanks to all the support team again at Middlesex, all my colleagues, Christian and everyone for enabling this evening, this recording to happen. Thank you. <laughs>